Serious, Germans over it. In what ways, if at all, does Germany recognize World War II veterans? One of my grandfathers was in the German army and fought on the Eastern Front during World War II. I haven't discussed his experiences with him about it in much detail, largely because he is understandably uncomfortable discussing it. I do know that he receives a pension from the German government for his military service at the time. The general consensus is that everybody was forced to join the Wehrmacht. Even if they did volunteer, every vet has some, more or less legitimate excuse for doing so. It is completely understandable that no sensible person nowadays would be proud to say that they just walked up to the gates of the army of Nazi Germany and yelled I want in, though quite a lot did. Most vets are well respected, today, however not because they served their country but because they managed to survive that living heck and maybe even a Soviet POW camp. Obviously that is today's situation because a few WW2 vets that are still alive, were young men, even teenagers, when they were drafted towards the end of the war. So one can assume that they weren't the ones who committed the most heinous crimes or start the whole thing in the first place. That was a lot different in the 50s and 60s. Vets were often frowned upon, particularly by the younger generation, as they were always suspected of being involved in war crimes or being a Nazi in general. It does have a lot to do with Germany's domestic politics in the 50s and early 60s. They basically just reset their minds to 1932 and went on as if nothing had ever happened. Dark times for young people. The military is still rather unpopular even today, often considered as a bunch of borderline alcoholics with little education and far-right tendencies who just couldn't cut it in the real world. Of course that's a gross oversimplification but many people are still under the impression of how they were treated by the petty officers during their mandatory service, which was just recently abolished. I actually live in Germany in a small town which happens to be home to a 90 year old German World War II veteran and took him to the 70th anniversary of the Normandy invasion last year. He was stationed there during the invasion and was taken prisoner and later sent to a POW camp in the USA, where he learned to speak English and was treated pretty much as any other human would, seeing the Americans around him as normal people and not enemies. We was not a convinced Nazi and never killed or shot at anyone, and was rather pacifistic during the war since he was forced to fight like many others. Many different news outlets interviewed him at the 70th anniversary, and none antagonized him. He also met many American veterans whom he embraced and talked with like old friends. The organizers of the anniversary events were happy to have him there, and he even got to shake the hands of President Obama and Queen Elizabeth. Among Germans he is recognized as a man who suffered his way through the war, as many others did, and he is not shunned for having been a German soldier, nor is he celebrated for fighting for the Nazis, but simply seen as a man who did as he was told, and did what he had to to survive. If you want to know more, his name is Paul Goles, look him up. In my family we never really talked about it. My grandfather was happy to share some stories about his time as a POW in France but not about his time as a soldier, and I'm pretty sure I never really asked. There is a German expression called Totschwegen which basically means to keep quiet about something to make it die. That is how many families approach their World War II history. The concept of veteran doesn't exist in Germany, at all. There are old people who've been in the war. They are not regarded as either good or bad. They are just old people with stories. Although, this was when I was young. Very few are still alive. And young people serving in the Bundeswehr, especially those who've been to Afghanistan and such, aren't regarded as veterans. They are regarded as idiots. Perhaps that is because there was little concept of a divide between civilian versus military at that time in Germany. Every male between 1640 alive in that time period fought in the war, and most of them died. If you were a woman or a child, you saw bombing and abuse. The concept of a veteran doesn't make as much sense when everyone was traumatized by the war. My grandfather and my granduncle both were veterans. The first one was an SS guy and a loyal Nazi that never thought that he did something wrong during the war. He was very high ranked and as people be executed he told these stories when I was drunk. Something that happened often during the last years of his life. He died some years ago. He was still keeping his Luger pistol and committed suicide after was diagnosed with Alzheimer. Beside all the Nazi crap he was a very kind, good looking and noble man. 
My grand uncle on the other side was in the Wehrmacht and fought in Stalingrad and got shot for three times so that was brought on until the whole situation got really bad. He died a few years ago too. We still keep his uniform in a box. The thing in Germany is, you can't tell stories like this with pride. We were the bad guys, we set the world on fire, and even if some of the German soldiers were good people, they were fighting for the wrong things. So it man veterans don't tell their stories and kids never hear them. And in some years we will only remember the stuff that's shown in documentaries. My 90 year old grandfather is a World War II veteran. He was ordered to serve at the defense of Berlin against the Red Army. He is, considering his high age, still at full mental health and can remember everything. He told me that he tried to escape army services on different occasions. One time when he had some sort of vacation he just stayed at a different location. He visited his girlfriend instead of his parents, without telling anyone. This way he had more time to ignore conscription orders and stuff like that. Well because he did not receive them, and the penalty for that was much 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 lighter than real deserting. It was his way of fighting the regime without getting in too much danger. He is very open minded towards other cultures and sexual orientations. One of his granddaughters is gay and he states that the only thing that matters is that she is happy. Which is quite impressive for his age considering the time of his socialization. In general World War 2 veterans will neither be praised nor hated. Since we learn in like 37,374 sessions in history class how the world was and what would have happened if people would have acted otherwise. IST just a sad part of our history in which some of our elderly played their roles and on the other hand those who acted by their beliefs. My parents who are in their mid 50s now have been more critical towards the World War 2 veteran generation since their parents were the ones involved in that zeitgeist was quite different. The people who get praised though are the anti-regime people like the Jeshwister Scholl, who are considered national heroes nowadays. After all heroes and history are made by winners. I was trying to decode a message like I was on Arnalep. If you are American you need to understand that there are vast differences between the way the general populace views the military. The Bundawa goes to great lengths to portray itself as just another employer. Thus it is usually viewed as any other career. To clarify, I'm 25 and I'd be super weirded out if someone talked about being in the Bundeswehr and someone thanked them for their service. I can get thanking a firefighter, but soldiers not so much. This is actually a problem to many soldiers who feel shunned by the general populace. There is a big anti-military sentiment in Germany. Like if you work for Rheem at all you will catch weird looks and get quizzed on how you justify building weapons. Consequentially you wouldn't know the vets from any other old pal. I met a few. My gramps another guy both were pow in Russia, and none are particularly happy to talk about it. Some will not want to talk about anything and just remark that those were crap times, and some will tell personal stories. They are not revered or shunned. A few years ago a guy in his late 80s was tried for war crimes, which still is not as uncommon as you would expect. He was part of the SS though. All in all I would describe it as regular respect, mixed with some pity for living in crap times. The whole my country right or wrong is not a strong sentiment in Germany these days. Thanks for asking such a thought provoking question. My grandfather was stationed in a Red Cross city a place solely for the wounded, and lost one of his legs there when the allies bombed the place. Most Germans I know feel pity for them. They were forced to fight, there was no honor in it. Or in short, we don't talk about it since we can't change the past anyway. It's more like a one time thing for the grandchildren to scare them from thinking war is honorable legitimate or something like that. We don't. The only people that lived during World War II that get some recognition are people who survived the concentration camps, and there are only a few of them left. My granddad fought in the war and was sent to Italy I think. He never spoke about it when he returned and nobody really asked. Two of his four brothers died in battle, I don't know where, and also his dad. So did many of his friends. Most people in Germany wish the war had never happened so celebrating people who were part of it seems odd. Today doing military service is kind of frowned upon. Mostly people who have no other option join the military and they are regarded as rather stupid for doing it. It has a rednecky taste to it. War in general is seen as unnecessary and wrong so taking part in it means that you're part of the problem. My grandfather turned 90 the other week. 
He was aboard a German minor sweeping boat in the English Channel in the early 1940s which ironically hit a mine and sank the boat. He was captured by an English boat and nearly died from a shrapnel wound in his stomach. He was moved around various POW camps and was set to work as a builder. Each day he would pass my English grandmother whilst he was on the back of a lorry on the way to a building site. One day he threw flowers and a note, and they started meeting up in secret. I swear his life could be made into an incredible film. Since my grandmother passed he has opened up a lot more about his time in the war and has some unbelievable stories. I've started asking him a lot of questions about it and recording our conversation to capture the information that would otherwise be lost, before it's too late. To go back to Arp's question, all I know is that after the war ended he was eventually sent back to Germany and was given 187 Deutschmarks. He gave some to his family and then came back to England. He still receives a German pension as recompense for being in the war. A lot of people talking about modern day in this thread. Veterans of the World War II, or the few who are still alive, are not recognized in any sort of public ceremonies or the like in Germany. It should be noted however, that the dead are. You will find a monument in pretty much every single village town city in Germany with the names of the dead from both world wars written on them. It's a good reminder of how much the war cost us. Especially when you see such a monument in some tiny farming village and there are almost 50 names on it. I guess the closest we have to war veterans of World War II is the concept of the trauma for all the rubble women who cleaned up after the glorious armies fought and destroyed entire cities because you know, when you dehumanize a foe in EU, there are no civilians, there are only acceptable casualties to break the fighting will of the German people, and in general, we call them Oma and Opa. My grandfather was a bomber pilot over Eastern Europe, and he hated every second of it. We are aware of the past, but are everyone who used to be a soldier and still alive was nothing more than a pawn, and b. Military today is seen as necessity, and nothing to be proud of. You don't see people running around announcing their veteran status at all, and it is something that is mostly ignored. Why would you make a special effort to honor individuals when basically 100% of the male populace at that time fought in the war? Many people here point to shame and the fact of Germany committing unimaginable atrocities during World War II. I think it is much more mundane. When honoring World War II veterans becomes synonymous with honoring old people, no one stands out. It doesn't really make any sense. Austrian here. We are, have a huge monument in the middle of Vienna ordered by Stalin thanking the Red Army for liberating Vienna from the fascist oppressors. So there's that. Also, lots of monuments mourning the dead of both world wars. As for personal stories, my grandfather volunteered for the German Navy in 38. His destroyer struck a mine in 1941. He got captured by the Soviets and spent 7 years in a gulag, as far as I know in mining. I think the death rate of German pals captured in 1941 was around 90% so it's a miracle he returned. They even had made a funeral for him already, although, survived. He committed suicide in 1968. PTSD, I think. I really would have liked to talk to him about this whole thing. So, yeah, the war is seen as a very negative affair. I'm glad I didn't have to see it. My Opa fought in World War II in a tank battalion on the Eastern Front. He was held prisoner of war for numerous years. He was very honest with me growing up and has told me many things. Horrid stories. He actually suffered from PTSD for a long time before he passed. He would always worry about money. At times he'd get thousands of dollars in cash from the bank. And food. He would buy basic things like bread and butter and stuff their freezer. And then he'd still be worried that we'd go hungry. He was studying to be a teacher but had to join the military at some point and was very upset about it. Veterans in Germany are not honored as they are here, but they do not get shunned. I think it's a quiet understanding that most a lot of soldiers did what they had to do to survive and to save their families. It seems like mostly shame. My travels to Berlin showed me that they still have signs where Jews used to live, encouraging the people to never forget the atrocities they committed. We don't, beyond a few right-wing extremists. Why do Americans and British? I've heard of things like Armed Forces Day at sporting events. This sounds like something out of a Sasha Baron Cohen film to me. What's the craziest World War 1 or 2 story you know? In World War 1 my grandfather fought in the trenches in France. 
One night the Germans were shelling them all night. About 5 in the morning they stopped. He found a pine log to use as a pillow to get some sleep until the sun came up. Then they'd have to dig out the trenches again. When he woke up the sun was out and the pine log he used as a pillow was somebody's leg. It had been blown off during the shelling. I bet it was more comfortable than a log would have been. My granddad and the great raid of an allied French factory. Basically my granddad, British Army World War II, was assigned to a group that was defending a French industrial sector and when he arrived he discovered that the factory was a producer of very top quality merchandise which the Brits were liberating for themselves. Anyway he goes outside for a long smoke and walks behind the factory only to see a squad of German soldiers loading up their half track with boxes of goods too. So he shoots himself and runs back to the captain and panics about how the Germans are so nearby. The captain coolly laughs and just exclaims oh yeah don't worry about them. We have a truce where they get the boxes on that side and we get the ones on this. So the moral of the story is that nothing brings rivals together like some good old fashioned looting. There are a ton of great ones from World War 2, but because I feel like the first World War doesn't get as much attention, I'll go with my favorite from that, Alvin C. York is among the biggest badasses to ever walk this earth. Wikipedia tells the story much better than I'm going to, but York was a sharpshooter and was sent out with 17 other men to infiltrate German lines and disable machine gun nests. They found a group of German soldiers and were taking them captive when they were ambushed by what York said was over 30 machine guns. Six were killed and three more severely wounded in the ambush, which made York the senior man as a recently promoted corporal. York began to pick off Germans as quickly as he could and rapidly began to inflict heavy casualties on the Germans. At one point during the engagement York was rushed by six men and he dispatched all six with his 1911. Eventually the casualties on the German side became so great that the senior man offered a full surrender to York. York and the seven remaining men with him walked back to camp with 132 German POWs, not to mention how many he left dead on the battlefield, and he eventually was awarded the CMH for his actions. Dude was a supreme bad butt. I don't have much information sadly about my grandfather in World War II, as he did not like to talk about his service, but what I do know is he was a Canadian paratrooper. During a training jump days before, the day before, D-Day, he was first out of the plane, and due to high winds broke both his legs, so he was stuck in a hospital bed for D-Day, where his plane and entire unit was shot down and perished. You're one lucky son of a bee. Look up Jack Churchill, fought with a claymore, only confirmed kill with longbow in the war, used bagpipes to direct men, just walked casually out of the least escapable Nazi prisoner camp, casually walked out of another, was angry the war didn't go on longer. My great grandfather was a marine, he fought in the Pacific on Guadalcanal, Bougenville, Tarawa and Iwo Jima, he was a tough mother sucker. He was only one of four guys that survived Iwo and his company. He always claimed to have a crown royal bag full of gold teeth but never showed us. He also told a story where he was using his K-bar to pry teeth out of a Jap's head when the guy's eyes popped open so my great grandpa unloaded his 1911 in the guy's face. Well when he died we found a crown royal bag full of gold teeth. Guys back then were savage. I always wonder what the difference maker is between guys who won't tell their stories and guys who tell you who they got their bag of gold teeth. Not craziest but one of the wackiest I have read came from Lieutenant Cole John George's book. On Guadalcanal a small group of Japanese soldiers infiltrated Henderson Field all loaded down with TNT. The Japanese soldiers snuck through the camp past the fuel dump with thousands of barrels of fuel. Past the ammo dump past all the tents where the pilots were sound asleep, and planted all of the TNT on one single plane, and blew it up. They could have easily crippled the airfield for weeks by blowing up all the fuel, or ammo, or they could have killed several valuable pilots, or they could have each used their TNT on separate targets, but for some reason they decided to blow up one single plane. They were the special forces. This is actually something that happened to my grandpa during World War II. I'm from Luxembourg, and so he was forced to fight for Germany on the Eastern Front. He told me that on Easter Day of 1944, there was a voluntary ceasefire for all soldiers in his immediate area. 
he described to me how he, a Russian, and a Brit all came together to pray celebrate. The only language they had in common was Latin. I think that's pretty freaking cool. This probably isn't crazy in the way you mean, but during World War II, my grandfather randomly met up in Japan with his brother-in-law. They were in different branches of the military, and they sent my grandmother pictures of the two of them drinking in a bar. It was amazing to her that they'd just run into each other, halfway around the world. I really like this story. Your grandma must have been so overjoyed to see that picture. Not the craziest, but my grandfather, who died when he was 81, over 10 years ago, and he was in World War II. He was part of tank personnel and his tank got shot by an anti-tank round which penetrates the tank and bounces around in there, basically killing everybody. Luckily, he was standing with his legs in the tank and his upper body out of the escape hatch. He sustained massive injuries to his legs, which caused him problems till the day he died, from the shrapnel flying around in the tank, but was fine other than that. Everyone else in that tank were killed, 9 men. He was a prisoner of war for 4 months after that until his fellow Americans saved him. The end of the war happened only 7 months after he was rescued. He received a purple heart for his service. I will always respect my grandfather for going through this for our country. I once read a story about a B-24 tail gunner on a raid over the Plosti oil refinery in Romania. The plane was hit by flak and broke in half. The tail part, being lightweight and with big airfoil surfaces fell slowly to the ground, so slowly that the tail gunner didn't notice the plane had been shot down until he landed. If I recall correctly, he even shot an enemy fighter as he fell. The fighter pilot never expected to be shot from a piece of a plane that was falling down. It's not crazy but my father fought to reclaim France. He was in the infantry and as they were in the process of pushing Germany eastward, the French people who had remained behind were coming out of the woodwork. One night. They recaptured a farmhouse and prepared to stay there for the night. The family insisted that the soldiers sleep inside while the family slept in the barn. In the morning, the soldiers clothes were all cleaned and pressed. Boots were shined. This was the only way they could show instant gratification. Dad didn't speak of the war or even watch war movies. But he liked to tell that story. I met a guy whose plane was shot down over Italy. He was a waste gunner and the plane was hit by flak. He said that he remembered being thrown around the plane and the next thing he saw was grey. He surrounded by grey and did not know what was happening. He eventually realized he was alive and falling through a cloud. He deployed his parachute and it opened enough to slow him but he thought he would have died if he had not landed in a swampy area. He was getting up to move out when a shot went past his head. He was captured by two home guard types. He said one was a little guy whose helmet seemed too big for him. The way he described him made me think of a Benny Hill character, that little old guy. He spent the rest of the war as a POW and when the camp was liberated the only hat he had available was from an Australian prisoner. He said Eisenhower came into the camp and yelled at him for not having the proper uniform. He told me the rest of his military career he would let anyone who yelled at him know how little that they were compared to Eisenhower. My advice is when you see those people walking around with a hat that says, whatever war veteran, stop and ask them about their experience. I have met an individual who was on the Indianapolis, a guy who was dropped into the Philippines to radio air support for the invasion, a guy who seemed almost embarrassed that he was working in the engine room off of Normandy. Isn't how I went from lieutenant, Col. 05, to 4 star general, 010, in about 2 years. Most impressive rise I've ever heard of. Crazy story involving my grandfather, not actually in the war itself, but when he came home from it. He served 2 years at the end of World War II, first in France. He arrived in Normandy about a week after D-Day. After Germany surrendered he was transferred to the Pacific Front. He was stationed in the Philippines and was part of the force that would have invaded Japan by land if Japan hadn't surrendered post-bombing. He came home to America in 1946, when my dad was 4 years old. My dad had been only 2 when my grandfather left, and for those 2 years my grandmother was a single mom raising my dad and his older sister. A younger brother was born later, my dad distinctly remembers, as a 4 year old coming downstairs for breakfast one morning, and was terrified at the strange man in a military uniform sitting at their kitchen table. He literally had no conscious memory of his father before that moment. 
This is literally my first memory. After my dad came home from the first Gulf War. After the relatively short war. He was still there for over a year clearing the Persian Gulf of Mines. I had one of my dad's expired IDs in my toy box where he had a big mustache. And they made him shave it during deployment. I remember it freaking me out because I didn't recognize him at all. My grandmother's brother died in World War II and was in a flamethrower battalion. She told me when I was growing up that he died running over the top of a hill. I think his tank exploded when he was shot. Flamethrowers were incredibly freaking dangerous to have strapped to your back, apparently. So in my little brain, I was picturing that she actually saw it happen. Like there was stadium seating or something and people just lined up to watch their family members in battle. It's not really a crazy story, but I held the idea that people watched wars from bleachers for way I I I I I I too long, so that's kind of crazy. In the American Civil War at some of the first battles there actually were reports of people who came out to watch the battles from a safe distance away and treated it like a picnic. This was back when they figured that this little insurrection would be dealt with quickly, but then crap turned sour, real quick. Both my grandfathers served during World War II. Both my grandmothers were involved with the Yuzo during World War II. I can't recall exact dates and locations on this, but I know the general story goes that both my grandfathers were going to be shipping out to their respective places in the war. Maternal grandfather was Air Force, paternal grandfather Army, on basically the same day, both from somewhere in southern CA I believe. Prior to their shipping out, they both met wonderful girls at Yuzo events and proposed. They were both married, and took their honeymoons in southern CA because they'd be leaving shortly after some R and R after the weddings. They each took the train to their honeymoon destination. They each took meals in the dining car of this train, and on the way to their destination met each other, became brief friends, and then parted ways with no intentions of keeping in touch. They figured all of this out at my parents wedding in the 70s when they reconnected and were certain they'd met before. That is absolutely insane. Small world for sure. Great story. Not crazy really but my history teacher told us a story about early into the war a battle took place between the British and the Germans. Back then the British had a really efficient army so when the battle started the Germans thought they were firing machine guns. The British were actually firing bolt action rifles the Lee Enfield and they were really quick at firing. One of my grandfather's good friends was at Omaha Beach on D-Day. He was charging, and took a round to the chest, only to have it hit his gold Zippo lighter, stopping the bullet. He then declared that he'd never stop smoking cigarettes. My Soviet grandpa fought in World War II. The Germans weren't prepared for the Soviet winter and he saw several Germans frozen on the ground. The General Winter. Granddad was a sniper with the US during the Italian campaign. He was captured and sent to Stalag 7 in Germany. He learned how to say the word farmer in German and was sent to work in a field for the Reich. A German farm girl would sneak eggs and milk to him, keeping him alive. He was liberated 9 months later, having dropped from 6 feet 4 inches and 220 pounds to 98 pounds. Your granddad must have ditched his scoped rifle or gotten extremely lucky when he was captured. Captured snipers were rarely taken prisoners. The French cavalry at the beginning of World War I wore uniforms almost exactly identical to the ones used in the Napoleonic era. In addition to this they rode into machine gun fire on horseback carrying lances and sabers. World War I was won by those who adapted quickest to technological advances. Unfortunately the French did not adopt modern strategy tactics until it was too late. Also the Germans had a gun that could shell Paris from 100 miles away. My great grandmother had to give up my grandma and great aunt to Christian families to protect them while she went into hiding and acted as a member of the resistance. After the war ended, she came back for her kids. However, she was so disheveled looking that my great aunt actually ran away from her thinking her to be a stranger. My great uncle was in multiple camps including Auschwitz and Dachau. His father and brother were killed three days before liberation, hung and burned in front of him. A week after liberation of the camp when he regained a bit of strength, my great uncle returned to the camp and dug up the bodies of his father and brother. He took pictures of everything. After digging them up, 
He buried them in Germany and moved to America. After becoming a successful businessman he returned to Germany and dug them up again to rebury them in empty olive in Jerusalem. The holiest cemetery for Jews. That's just a couple of the many family stories. There are no shortage of crazy World War II stories though. My grandfather was a very intelligent man. Received many medals of service while fighting with Canadian forces during World War II. We was eventually lent to the American spearhead that was racing across Europe to be the first ones to liberate Berlin because he spoke so many languages. As they were going in, he learned of a force that was going on to liberate concentration camps, and volunteered to go with as he spoke the languages that were used by many of the prisoners in the camps. I asked him how many languages he spoke when he was 81 years old or so. He said oh something like 15 or 16 fluently. I think I can understand close to 50 or 60 local dialects though. I don't remember. Anyhow, this man goes with the Americans to help communication while at the camps. And while at one camp, meets my grandmother, who we do not know how old she actually is. All I know is that she is an Austrian gypsy. And all her records of birth are destroyed and she spent time in the concentration camps. Her father was the elected person to talk to the American forces. So my grandfather wound up meeting her and brought her back to Canada. And now my family grows each year because my grandfather met this wonderful feasty lady. A grandpa passed away 15-16 years ago. Grandma is on her deathbed right now actually. Neither of them really talked about how they met or anything about the war ever. I don't blame them. I actually didn't even know my grandfather was at the camps until I was about 10 years old and was looking at pictures of liberation of the camps and said to my dad that man looks like a young grandpa and dad said, that's because it is your grandpa, and then showed me the pictures in grandpa's den. When my grandmother passes, I am sure I will get to learn more. I know she kept letters and records of her time in the camps. I know she kept my grandfather's records of service and such. But they never shared them. We figure grandma is 91-93 years old. Possibly younger. Possibly older. She doesn't know her year of birth. Her father passed away shortly after the camp was liberated. Regardless we arbitrarily celebrated her 90th last year because why not. She has now had 3 90ths. Essentially every 3 years or so we change the birthday celebration to the new age which is like 85 to 90. Next year we move to 95. Comma sadly, we doubt she will make it to the end of March or so. That would have to be my grandpa. He was in Europe in World War II helping wounded soldiers back to be treated. When some of the other men started to look at him all wide eyed and pale, like they'd seen a ghost. So my grandpa asked them what was wrong. Are you feeling okay so of course he was. He thought. Then someone pointed to his helmet. My grandpa took his helmet off to see what was wrong. Here's where it's important to know that the helmet issues to my grandpa did not properly fit his head. It sat such that there was a maybe 2-3 inch gap between the top of his head and the top of the helmet. So inside the helmet was just empty space because it couldn't be pushed down far enough onto my grandpa's thick skull. Upon inspecting the helmet, he noticed a bullet hole in the front of it and an exit in the back. He had been shot right in the helmet, but the bullet went entirely through the empty gap in the helmet and went out the other side. It was sheer luck. It was officially reported that he had been shot in the head but survived, even though it was not the case. When he was awarded a purple heart for the occasion, he tried to explain the mistake but they gave it to him anyway. And that's how my family has the most illegitimate purple heart in US history. My grandfather's ship was sunk in World War 1 and he survived with his saxophone only to be picked up by another ship which was later sunk again. He and the saxophone both survived the second sinking as well. That was one lucky dude. Lucky saxophone. My grandfather was part of the Zagota, an underground Polish, predominantly Jewish resistance group. He led a lot of campaigns to smuggle Jews out of the ghetto by using stolen garbage trucks and hiding people in them. My grandmother and grandfather would help smuggle Jews out of the country with fake birth certificates and passports. He passed when I was 3 years old but my grandmother told me a story about them I'll never forget. My grandfather, grandmother and other members of the resistance were using an old house in a forest as a main base at one point. They had fake papers and uniforms of Russian police to avoid suspicion. 
At one point a squad of Gestapo German police decided to take the house for themselves to use as a base. However my grandfather talked them into sharing the space with them. Little did the German officers know. At night my grandfather and his fellow soldiers would hunt Nazis. Imagine the movies Defiance and Inglorious Bastards mashed together pretty much. And put them on trial for their crimes. My grandmother was the record keeper and my father told me he's seen the records of the people they tried and executed for war crimes. Eventually after around 6 months of living under the same roof as the Gestapo, they were ready to move on so they rounded up the officers during the night and put them on trial. Hitler survived the war and fled to South America where he was cloned several times and at least one of his clones lives to this day working for ISIS. My grandfather joined the army during World War II even though he was underage. He ended up pee off the guy in charge of his basic training. According to family legend, the dude put my grandpa on the bus to go to war instead of the bus to go home, as he was underage. So he ended up in Europe. When he arrived there, something went wrong. I don't know what, exactly. My grandfather hated to talk about it, but he and one or two other soldiers ended up behind enemy lines and were left for dead. They backpacked for about a week trying to get back to allied controlled territory and thankfully, made it back unscathed. They found a dead Nazi along the way, my grandfather kept his gun and his riding crop, which my dad later donated to museum or something. In World War 1, an American soldier spared a German soldier's life and they let the German soldier return to his army. This German soldier was a young Adolf Hitler. British soldier. The first soldiers captured at Normandy were Koreans. What happened was they had been captured and pressed into service by the Japanese against the Russians, who captured them and pressed them into service against the Germans, who captured them and pressed them into service against the Americans. There is a movie about them. Can't remember the name but it was produced for the Korean market. It's a pretty good movie. Worth searching for, Imo. <laughs> Lieutenant. Cole. James Keefe was on a bombing run to target munitions factories. When they realized the enemy was flying with them, the bomber had one of its engines shot out and not enough fuel in the remaining engines to return to allied space. This was all on the eve of his 21st birthday in March of 1944. One of the officers on board was found hiding under the parachutes having raided the first aid kits of all the morphine in a final hurrah before going down. He ended up crashing the plane in Holland where he found himself near a farm. The Gestapo had seen the plane and the pilots bailing from the plane. He went to a nearby tool shed and carefully entered it, replacing the shovel that was leaning against the door as it closed. He then hid under a rabbit hutch behind bags of feed and fertilizer as the Gestapo entered. They looked in and left, interrogating the owners, who were ally sympathizers. They didn't give him up. With the help of the Danish underground he has moved from safe house to safe house in attempts to make it back to England. In July of 1944 the Dutch underground manages to sneak him into Belgium, he is betrayed and captured in Antwerp. There, a German interrogator he nicknames Big Guy spells out in chilling words what he had feared most. So you see, Lieutenant, we know all about you and where you've been since you came down. We know the people you've stayed with and we know what they do. But we're not going to do anything at this time because we want them to keep sending us evading flyers like you. I worked as a caregiver for this man and if you'd like to know the whole story I recommend picking up his memoir 2 gold coins and a prayer. He sadly passed away last year and the book is one of the best written memoirs I've ever experienced. Jim had an eidetic memory so when the memoir was written it was almost 100 pages longer. I got several from my dad's dad's dad. My great granddad who apparently was batshit crazy, whilst training in the Orkneys, he and his friend tried to steal a Shetland pony for his friend's daughter. They got it halfway inside of a kit bag before their superior found them. Christmas 1944 he is back in Blighty, he and his girlfriend, my great grandmother, are walking home hand in hand with some groceries. One of his army friends is walking the other way with what looks like some groceries of his own. When they walk past his friend hands over his groceries to my great granddad and without saying a word they keep walking. Great grandmother asks what that was all about, he explains. Turns out his friend had stolen some meat from a pantry that was somehow used by the military police I am guessing it was in a building they operated out of. 
So basically his friend decided to split the meat 50 stroke 50 with my great granddad as my great grandmother came from a poorer family and won't be able to afford a dinner Christmas dinner for all the family. Matt Damon got lost behind enemy lines and Tom Hanks had to go find him with bunch of guys and one piece of crap up him. Frick up him. Then he got lost in Mars. Stupid Damon. After the World War II, my grandparents, then 1716, living in the East Germany moved to USSR Tashkent, now Uzbekistan, not Borat's country, they lived there for 30 years, my mom was born there and they all moved to Turkey, lived there for 12 years, then my mom got married to a my Turkish dad there, after living in Turkey 5 years together, my parents decided to move back to Uzbekistan, they lived there 19 years, I was born there then when I was 10, 2009, we immigrated to Canada, Alberta, we stayed there 2 years then moved to Montreal, now my parents and I live in Montreal until now and not thinking about moving lol, so now I speak Turkish, German, Russian, Uzbek, French and English, but I had a not that good childhood all because of ww, now whenever I tell someone I'm half Turkish half German and was born in Uzbekia they get confused or just assume that my dad was a bladed Turk who used to be Turkish immigrant but actually my mom was an immigrant in Turkey. Three generation of family traveled all over the world lol. During World War 2 my old neighbor was a bomber. He told me one time the bombs got stuck and didn't drop out of the plane. He ended up standing on the wing of the plane and kicking the bombs off in the middle of a fight. Not a specific story, a set, but it has always boggled my mind how much M was being used during World War II Japanese kamikaze pilots, the German Wehrmacht army, allied bomber pilots, everyone was methed out of their minds which, to me, has always made the craziness of WW2 even that much more crazy. It even shaped the war as Hitler's erratic decisions towards the end of the war have been widely attributed to his escalating MUs. My step-grandfather took some shrapnel to the neck in Italy in World War II. He was being brought to the medical tent on a stretcher. I'm not sure why, but the stretcher wouldn't fit through the door. While the medical people were trying to figure it out, he got up and walked in, saving them the trouble. I just read The Last Panther, a memoir about the Halby Kessel in the last days of World War II. At one point he sees the miraculous Luftwaffe wonder weapon, the gleaming metal aeroplane that flies without propellers, being towed by a team of oxen, because they no longer control an airfield for it to take off from. Grandfather was a radio operator in the North Africa campaign, great uncle fought in Burma, but neither of them talked about it. I worked for a guy named Gus. He was a Greek American who served in the US infantry in World War II. He was fighting in Italy. One day, he was taking a break in a village and fiddling with his Tommy gun. Thompson submachine gun. An Italian shopkeeper was watching him and called to him. Hey GI, you need a help with gun? Gus walked over to the guy. Turns out the guy was a leather worker who had experience as a gunsmith. He explained to Gus that the Americans were too sloppy with the Thompson. Spraying bullets everywhere and missing the Italian soldiers. He had just the thing to help. He gave Gus a smartly designed thigh strap that connected to the Tommy gun via a leash. And featured a quick disconnect. While marching around, the gun could swing naturally at your side. When you brought it up to fire from the hip, it would pull up straight and fire at hip level. You could pull up tight and still maintain a level ray not fire. Alternatively, you could snap off a quick disconnect and go weapons free, bringing the Thompson to your shoulder and sighting down the barrel, or whatever else you wanted to do. Gus said it was a beautiful bit of gear and worked great. He offered the guy some lira, but the guy gave it to him free. Go win this war so we can get back to normal, the guy said. So that was how an Italian actively encouraged and enabled the enemy to destroy his own side during a war. Crazy. Man. As I recall, the Italians tired of Mussolini pretty quickly into WWLL and it was mostly Germans doing the fighting in Italy for most of the war. What are some stories your parents, grand or grand grandparents told you about World War 2? My great grandmother's younger brother was killed as a child, along with most of the family, and they buried him. A little while later, she saw a little boy in her village wearing his boots. She was furious as they had buried him in his boots. She demanded the boots back, dug her brother up, put the boots back on him, and reburied him. 
This is the same woman who had Nazis storm her house, shoot everyone including her, and she had to play dead so that they would leave. Once they were gone, she ran away and lived with this family in Russia for a bit. They didn't have much but they took her in and cared for her for a while. To this day, we send that family food, clothes, etc because they need it. We refer to them as our aunts, uncles, and cousins. My grandfather was shot in the head during D-Day storming the beach. He survived the shot to the head. They never removed the bullet because it was more dangerous to try and take it out than to leave it in. He recovered and was sent back to the front. He also was one of the people who liberated Dachau concentration camp. That's all I was told. I was hoping he would tell me more after my deployment, but he didn't talk about the war other than that. It's normal he wouldn't. If you read anything recorded from Dachau, it was horrific. Even for soldiers liberating the camp, it's a common theme among the soldiers in that war, the silence. The trauma made it hard to talk about it, except for some lighter moments over the years. My grandfather was a marine and fought on Iwo Jima. He never talked about it, so I asked him. He wouldn't say a whole lot about what happened, just things about how the ground was volcanic ash that his legs sunk into and the fact there were so many bodies everywhere that you had to run or step over them. One day I kept asking questions and he said one day he was in a foxhole. I believe that's what he said, and he was talking to his buddy who was in the foxhole with him. His buddy wasn't saying anything and looked over and his buddy's face was basically blown off. He said that was his best friend. I believe he said he met him at basic training. He also said that at night the Japanese soldiers would taunt the Americans and tell them they were all going to be murdered and call them Yankees. You're going to die tonight, Yankees. So I never really asked anything again. I found out years after his death how horrifying Iwo was and how many marines died there. He was one heck of a man to get through that living heck. Over 26,000 American deaths in 36 days. 722 a day. Imagine more people than you probably see on an average day killed every day for over a month. My grandpa died at age 82 about 11 years ago. He was being shipped out right as the Pacific Theater ended, and was stationed in Japan for a few months. As far as I know he never saw combat. He still had nightmares almost weekly until the day he died. Lung cancer misdiagnosed as constipation, because the cancer traveled to his bowels as he had quit smoking 25 years before. I know it's not a very exciting World War II story, but I found it fascinating that training and deployment can affect someone so much that they still had nightmares about it a half a century later. I was born in 85, and my grandpa was mostly deaf by the time I was old enough to talk to him. But god dang he loved lawn care, riding that John Deere mower till he couldn't. My autistic younger brother one time yelled at him for yelling at my grandma. He hated his hearing aids. What a trip down memory lane this has been. My grandparents took a trip to Japan in the mid 70s. They brought back a lot of lovely souvenirs, such as beaded glass bonsai, other art and panchiko game they mounted on their wall. I guess, my grandmother was born in 1928. She lived on a farm outside of Aberdeen, wah, they ate their farm horse. My granddad on my English side fought in the war but never wanted to talk about it, understandably. However, he did say a few things. One which stuck in my mind as a small child was that as they were running up the beach on D-Day, the guy running next to him got his top half shot but his legs kept running for a moment. Another was while he was part of a tank crew, he was asked whether he would like a promotion. To what I can't remember, let's just say captain. He turned it down, because as he said, the captain was the one who had to stick his head out of the top and he didn't want to get shot. And, memorably, when asked whether he hated the Germans, I'm half German. He said no, it was the bloody French I couldn't stand. We take their villages and they'd come out waving Union flags. Then the Germans would take it back and they'd come out waving German flags. Bit more colorful language. He was from Yorkshire. Also, a semi-related story, but the first time my German mother went to visit my English grandparents, she made a comment about the nice watch my granddad was wearing. My grandma, without thinking, went, you, is that the one you took off that dead German soldier? My German family also had an interesting war. My granddad was the youngest of three sons, and the other two fought and died, one in the Wehrmacht, one in the SS. 
His uncle was also imprisoned in Darkow, where the SS brother was a guard. They lived in what is now Poland, and had to travel west as the Russians approached. My granddad left the village with the vicar's pregnant wife first, to make sure she got to safety, and they made it on the last boat out of the harbor before the Russians arrived and started bombing ships etc. He also helped with the rebuilding of Frankfurt. My grandma's house was seized and used as an army hospital by the Americans when they got there, which is less interesting but still weirded me out as a kid walking around that house imagining the wounded soldiers that had been there. It wasn't uncommon for large houses to be used as small hospitals or convalesce centers during and after the war. In Great Britain, for example, a lot of volunteers offered their houses to help soldiers get back on their legs post-surgeries, and had nurses working directly there. Opa was in Holland at the time and was loaded onto a bus taking them to a camp. Opa being the stubborn Dutchman that runs through my family to this day saw his opportunity to escape and he did. The bus had to pull over and stop for some reason. I do not know the reason, but he was lucky. They were next to a cornfield. Opa saw the chance and ran off that dang bus and never looked back. Ran until he couldn't anymore. Got home packed his bags and moved to Canada right after the war. My great granddad fought in the British army somewhere in the west. He was taken as a POW by the Germans and sent to a camp in Poland for the remainder of the war. From what I've heard, he made a Polish or Russian friend somewhere along the way, and that friend was eventually executed. Not exactly sure of the details. I'd have to ask my gran. But by all accounts he didn't like talking about the war. I'm thankful to have got to meet him when I was young before he died at the age of 92. He was a great man and is remembered fondly. My grandmother watched as a smoking German submarine came into the harbor where they lived. The submarine had been bombed by a British plane. Barely floating and leaking all kinds of fluids and she saw when crying grown men carried their dead comrades. Some of which was torn to shreds out of the hatch onto a horse drawn carriage for disposal. My grandfather told me that German soldiers often crashed local parties. Not to stop it or anything just to get drunk tell stories and maybe get some tail. It was well known that soldiers from the Wehrmacht was normally decent people who you could have a chat with but Waffen soldiers was batshit crazy and beat you if you so much as looked at them even Wehrmacht soldiers. Once a local and a Wehrmacht soldier got into a fight over a woman and the German soldier nearly possibly lost his eye, the Waffen soldiers that showed up said nothing to the locals. They kicked the German soldier and shouted at him in German when he was down and took him away. My great grandfather, Jesse James Clymer, was in the navy, and left my great grandmother behind with their daughter and another on the way. Stationed at Pearl Harbor, he wrote letters to her, telling her about how beautiful Hawaii was, and that he wanted to show her the island when the war was over. The day after receiving the letter, the Japanese bombed the US naval base, and he found himself in the hospital days later. His lips and chin had been near blasted off from the explosion. My great grandmother heard of the bombing and thought she'd never see her husband again. But a month or so later he'd been shipped back home with a purple heart pinned to his shirt, and the biggest smile on his face. He got to come home, son some face flesh, and meet his newborn son. Brilliant. Look how close you came to not being born. My grandfather fought with anti-tank weaponry against the Germans in World War II. He was always very quiet about it, but he told snippets to my aunt. One of them was that he managed to hit a certain tank. It lit up entirely and he saw young, burning guys jumping out of it, young enough to be teens. Hit him him hard, because he was 17 at the time. He always said war shouldn't have been invented, as it only brings violence and death. He was a bit peculiar but loving grandparent. He spent his last months in bed at my aunt's house. He once said to my aunt that he knew that good news was coming. Right before my parents went to my aunt's to tell him that my mom was pregnant of me. When he received the news, he started crying and jumped out of bed. He went to the attic and gave my parents the crate he used in war to keep his belongings. Shortly after that he died peacefully. I would have loved to meet him as he sounded like a great man. Those tanks were like metal coffins. When a tank got hit the inside would light up and the metal would act like an oven. When the flame reached the ammo it would cause a chain reaction that would blow it up and kill soldiers caught around it on the upside though America had some of the easiest tanks to escape from. 
My grandfather never talked about the war but I heard a few stories from my grandmother after he died. I was assured by her that as an American serving in the Pacific he was on standby for the invasion of Japan. Had the atomic bombs not forced Japan to surrender my mom would likely have never been born. In one area where he was stationed local women apparently didn't wear much clothing and their breasts were usually exposed. Thinking they could help the women out they collected old t-shirts among the soldiers and donated them to the women. The next time they saw the women they were wearing the shirts but had cut out holes over the breasts again leaving them exposed. Need more information about the one area. One of my grandfathers was on a German minesweeper. He was involved in Operation Kerberos, bringing battleships Scharnhorst and Niesenor through the England Channel back into North Sea. In total he experienced three times that ships he was assigned to got sunk. Three times in the water. Three times rescued. He got one major severe injury. He never told about what it was. In the last months of the war he was assigned to a U-boat, German submarine. Just made a few exercise trips but never on a battle tour. Was more than lucky when the war was over. Was after that a broken man. Very nice. Best grandfather you could have. I once played a U-boat simulator with him shortly before he died. He was very interested and came up with the things he learned during his time on the U-boat but you also noticed that it was somehow too much. He covered his trauma with jokes but you saw that he was uneasy with it. My granddad was a navigator in bomber command in the RAF. I remember him telling us a story of call they got of a ship had been hit by a U-boat and their support vessels were still in danger as the submarine was still in the area. Their bomber was first on scene. A gunner from one of the support vessels began shooting lines of bullets in the water to indicate to them from what direction the torpedo had come from. As they had an accurate time of when the torpedo hit in a direction, they began dropping depth charges. Luckily one of these managed to hit it and disable it a short distance away from the scene of the attack. The U-boat was forced to surface and surrender to their circling bomber. Was the first ever case of a submarine being captured surrendered to an aircraft. Another story was after the war ended. His job was to fly personnel and pals back home or to other bases. One of these flights they had American soldiers who were captured by the Japanese. One of the men who before the war was a very tall man of 6 feet 5 inches or so, was kept in a box by the Japanese. When he was rescued and flown home he barely stood more than 5 feet 5 inches. He spent almost a year in a box simply because he was tall. My grandfather was all station in the end of 1944 so the German was starting to force enroll younger and younger people in the SS he was a student and at the end of that years because everyone knew the German Reich was going to collapse and that if he was to continue his studies he would be enrolled and would probably die. He gone in hiding in the forest for 6 months and enrolled in allied forces and gone up to Austria with them. Fun fact, he refused to go back to Germany ever after. After that he went to do the Indochina war, came back to Austria, back to Alsace, to the war of Algeria and finally he could settle a bit. My grand uncle was one of the people in Germany during the Holocaust. He was a Christian but his close friend and his family were Jews. This was apparently a village on the outskirts of Germany. When the Nazis began capturing and executing Jews he remembered the terror that spread over the village. The village was quite isolated and half the villagers were Jews. Now you may not know this but Jews were tracked through synagogue records and police certificates. Since this was an out of the way village the only records were within a synagogue. Apparently the Cohen burned all the existing records, before forging fake ones himself and hung himself from a rafter. When the soldiers arrived they checked the fake records and no one in the village went by those names. The villagers made up a story about how the Jews from the village escaped to the United Kingdom. The soldiers searched people's houses but all Jewish objects were replaced with crucifixes and Bibles. It sounds fake but considering it was a small, isolated village it didn't seem far-fetched. This apparently bought the Jewish families time to escape. After this a few Jews truly converted to Christianity while a few fled to the United Kingdom. Quite an interesting story. Makes you wonder how many Jews actually managed to trick the Nazis. My great uncle was a cook in a British army unit that liberated one of the men a concentration camps. He hated Germans until he died in the late 90s. My mother tells us of walking to school and having air raid sirens going off and going to the nearest bomb shelter. She was 6. Would be walking with her 12 year brother, no adults, mind you. She is still alive today and talks about rationing. 
Hearing the V2S, my aunt was a student nurse who left home at 14 and served in a burn unit in Suffolk, I think. She told us her memories of D-Day. She said the planes just kept flying over and over for days on end. Shortly after, the wounded started pouring in. She also told us of the first returning POWs from Japan. Some dumbass decided on the first night back that they would serve rice pudding. A riot commenced. My great grandfather passed away two summers ago and I never asked him about his time in Iwo but he was in the Battle of the Bulge so I'd say that speaks for itself. Same for my grandfather. He never spoke about it but one time while he was drunk on a fishing trip, said he's killed at least 15 men. But the one that stuck with him was the one that was no more than a few feet away from him. Said, we were both surprised to see each other, I was quicker with my weapon. I could see in his eyes he knew it was coming. Then he was dead, and I wasn't. My great grandfather fought in both world wars. I often ponder why he would re-up after making it through the first one alive. Popular family opinion is that he never really did settle back into life after World War 1. Found being on the front easier than dealing with his mind. I have a letter he wrote home to his mother, it will be 100 years old in November. Fascinates me that I can hold this piece of paper that was in the trenches with him. His mother had obviously asked him if he thought the war had changed him. His reply no one can live through this and understand it let alone come home the same person that left. My pop was in World War 2 in Mill Bay PNG. I have a letter that his commanding office wrote to his parents stating that there was no other man throughout the world that I would have chosen over your son to be my right hand man. His shooting ability is second to none and his bravery was more than a mere mortal he went on to explain in detail how pop copped a bullet in the lower back three days into their mission however with no reinforcements available pop refused to leave the front line for a further three days until he copped shrapnel in his foot and literally couldn't crawl let alone walk. This injury would ultimately end his life 40 years later. His parents would have been proud of him, especially the shooting bit. Learned that on the farm shooting crows at lambing time and continued to be a sought after dingo trapper till the day he died. So much more I could say about both these brave diggers. So proud to be of their blood. I'll make this a short version from what my grandpa has told me. My great grandfather hated his dad and ran away to join the marines at 16. He eventually turned 18 in a foxhole in the Solomons. In one of these foxholes he was with his best friend from childhood who would not stop playing his guitar and lower his head when getting shelled. When the guitar had stopped he looked up and found his buddy's head gone and two little things sticking out of his neck when his head was. He carried a bar and was only 5 feet 6 135 pounds. Said him and everyone else that carried them trashed the bipod because they were too heavy. He got malaria once laid in some hospital for a month. Went back to combat got shrapnel on his leg and back. Purple heart. Brought back a Japanese flag with blood still on it. That's pretty neat I must say. He survived the war and wound up in Mississippi with his brother. Kept his box of medals personal items for his mom and threw the rest of his uniforms AMD duffel bag over a bridge into the Mississippi River. He hated everything about it. A month later his brother was stabbed in the back in a bar and died. They had gone through all that and he died that way. He was an alcoholic ever since until he died. I only heard him talk about the war once. He did not need to. The old faded green tattoos and looking at him was enough. My grandpa just said he would only talk about it when he was drunk. Otherwise you would never get a peep about anything. My grandma's dad flew some kind of planes over Europe. Apparently they were carrying some high ranking officer. One flight when their landing gear malfunctioned they crash landed on the runway catching fire. My great grandpa had to carry to man out to safety or he would have been caught in it and died. He suffered major burns all up his legs doing this good deed which he carried with him until the day he died. He was 95 I do believe. He was never able to wear shorts again at least me or no one else ever saw his legs. My grandma said he always had them covered up growing up no matter what. Okay so my grandma is German. Now she was born on the 20th of April. Hitler's birthday. This meant that if her parents had named her Adolfine they would have gotten 50 RM. Reichsmark. She's so proud of her parents that they didn't name her like that. Her older brother was in the Hitler Reich where he died in 1945. My grandma has only one picture of him in uniform hanging in the kitchen. There is no swastika on it. 
actually Hitler forbid female versions of his name, so that can't be true. It was illegal to name a daughter a female version of Adolf or Hitler. I have stories from both sides of my family. On my mom's side, my grandfather was drafted and served in the US Army. He fought at Normandy, and he was eventually wounded at the Battle of Aachen. He was hit by shrapnel that broke his femur bone. Amazingly, the main reason it didn't cause even worse damage was that it hit his wallet first. He had it in his pocket because it was stuffed full of photos of my grandmother and his family and friends back home. My mom still has the wallet. You can see where the shrapnel blow past it. But it's kind of amazing to hold this piece of history and think about how in a nearly little sense my grandfather's family saved his life. On my dad's side, both his parents were Jews in Poland. My grandfather was a teenager and rode his bike into Russia and hid there during the war. My grandmother was also a teenager and had three younger brothers ranging from 14 to 4. My grandmother and great grandmother gathered up the boys and fled when the Nazis invaded. And it was due to the bravery of various Polish families that they were hidden throughout the war. My grandma has told me stories about farmers sneaking them food inside of the pig food bucket so the patrolling Nazis wouldn't suspect they had people in their barns. They were eventually liberated by the Russians before making their way to an American displaced persons camp where my grandma met my grandpa. He was teaching English to the kids. I heard a few stories from my maternal grandpa about being in the army, but I wish I had known to ask more. I also wish I had known to ask my great grandmother more about her life. She died when I was little, but now that I have a child I think about how terrifying it must have been for her to gather four children and keep them safe in that kind of nightmare. My paternal grandmother has a few pictures my great grandma saved from before they fled, and she has photo albums from their time in the displaced persons camp. We've slowly tried to digitize them so we don't lose these pieces of history. My mom has retired but she taught US history for her career. She used to tell her students my grandmother's story. And after they got really invested in hearing about hiding from Nazis and their close calls with being caught, she would reveal it was her mother in. Law story. It would always blow the students' minds and really bring home the reality of the horrors of World War II. When my grandmother was younger she would come and talk to my mom's classes too. My late grandpa always said somebody is always looking over you, I guess this was his case in World War 2. His first night in London the Luftwaffe were bombing the city and his sergeant told him to move his butt to the bunker. The whole area around the bunker was just large craters from bombs. Everyone survived. He arrived at Normandy two weeks after D-Day. It wasn't until he was at a free on board in France and saw the bodies of deceased allied soldiers laying in the woods. This is where crap got real for him. Some time later Germany makes a last ditch effort. Battle of the Bulge. Allied forces especially Americans suffered heavy casualties. He was sent back to England to train as a medic. He knew this meant fighting on the front lines. Some time later he arrives via train in a small blown up town. But, the battle ended. He told me he was one lucky sob. One thing he always reminded my family members was that someone is always watching over you and be thankful for them, whatever or whoever that may be. And in one lucky sob that he can now watch over me. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. for now.